Now, hi guys and welcome to the Los Angeles International Film Festival. So we are on a producing panel at the moment and our special guests are Hal Corky Kessler, Nan Putz, yes. Dave Debord and Patrick Rea. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. And welcome, welcome to the first Los Angeles International Film Festival. So I have a few questions. I know you're all, you have so much information to give us. So thank you for joining us today. And I have some questions myself and then I'm sure you have more stuff to tell us as well. So we'll go from there. Okay, before we start, I want to tell you that I'm an executive producer. So I wear that hat in your producing panel. Yes, so please everyone introduce yourselves and what you do in the film industry. Uh, my, I'll, go, I'll go if you guys, um, I am a producer, director, uh, also a writer and editor. Um, and I'm based out of, the, out of Kansas City where it's really, really cold right now and snowing. So uh, not filming outside at the moment. <laughs> wow, yeah. Hi, uh, Corky Kessler. I've uh, been a speaker during Sundance for 22 years and can in Toronto and now the, the Los Angeles Film Festival. I've been the attorney on uh, 24 movies. I'm working on 20 more. And I was one of the principal people responsible for one of the biggest incentives in the United States called Section 181. Excellent. Thank you, Corgi. We'll talk a bit more about that later. So, Nan. Hi, I'm Nancy Pitts, and my friends call me Nan, and I'm thrilled that Natasha does. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, experience is in producing, and also I'm a writer, but I don't write myself. What my specialty with that is that I edit scripts. So right now I'm involved with editing two scripts. I have produced... Um, six films myself. I don't direct, I do. Um, I'm the connector, as Corky likes to say. I pull people and money together, and I pull people and objects together. And if I had gone to film school, which I do advocate, I would have liked to um, really work towards being a line producer, which I think is a critical job in producing, just the first person that I always think about hiring. I have been assisted on multiple uh, films, and right now, I'm involved as a producer on two feature films. One of them's a documentary, and the other one, which is based on a true story, is a drama and action, and it's real exciting. And both of those are slated to go forward in 2021. And I'm editing two scripts, I think I said, yeah. Thank you, Nan. So, Dave, oh, I'm very excited to hear about what you're up to. You yeah. So, um, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, of course, I know. Uh, you know, I'm very good friends with Corky and Nan. I've done those those two for a while, and good to see them. Good to see you two look healthy. And uh, Patrick, nice meeting you. Nice to um, meet you. Um, yeah. So I get involved in all kinds of stuff. Like I'm, you know, I've, I've uh, you know, in, I'm involved in one production that Corky's also involved in that he got me involved in. Um, that's a music biopic. So I'm involved in that one. And that one's active. Um, there's another one, uh, the, the one that I just came off of the phone on, or actually it was a Zoom call right before this one, um, is uh, I'm, I'm, the screen, I'm a screenwriter I'm a, and I'm on the producing team of a uh, family film. It's a camp film. Um, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, like including the title, but I can tell you that uh, we've got, you know, uh, uh, even though I do direct, we, we brought in a director, um, and uh, his name is Sean Olson, and he has a couple of films on Netflix, and there's one that's actually just hitting the UK theaters in 150 theaters called, it's Max Winslow and the House of Secrets, or something. and Max oh, yeah. Winslow. Yeah, okay, so that's, so he directed I that. I have some friends work on that movie, so. Oh, okay, all right, then they know Sean, no. yeah. So, uh, and then the, the, the producer of it, has the, uh, at least, you know, this may not, this it may actually be dated now, but it, but he had the producer of it, his name is uh, Phil Glasser, who 
um, you know, had a successful uh, young acting career and was like Feifel and uh, American Tale and all that. But then he's, you know, now he, he's full on producing and he has, uh, it either is currently or was just um, the number one film in America, which is a Robert De Niro film called War on Grandpa or something like that. And uh, so, so uh, anyway, so I, so he's a great guy. So I just got off the phone with the, with the EP, that director, that producer, and um, we already have a draft of the script and now we're getting to ma do major rewrites now that those guys are on board and we're already talking casting. And so hopefully I'll have even, more to talk about uh, with that. And then I'm involved in some other stuff. I'm involved in a, in, a, um, in a drama about childhood schizophrenia and I'm a producer on that one, but I, I do a lot of the screenwriting work. And so we're, we're sort of honing in on that. And um, yeah, just blah, blah, blah. And then of course, like a lot like Corky, I, <clears throat> I do panels all over the place. Um, you know, probably the next panel I'll do is at the Sunscreen Film Festival down in St. Pete. So if it, anybody's thinking about going to St. Pete, we are doing it in person. It's fantastic. And uh, so let me know. And, when yeah, is that, that, David? That when one's is Sunscreen. That? Sunscreen Film Festival. I know. When? When? Oh, that's um, April 29th through May 2nd. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, I, uh, Dave, Dave, does your other film have a lawyer yet? Which one? The one that you just got off your uh, Zoom with. Yeah, yeah, they do. Okay. <laughs> that was what I got brought into, man, or else, you know. But um, yeah, so anyway, so, so I do a bunch of uh, panels and then, um, and then actually, uh, the last thing I'll say about that so we can move on to the topics is, is uh, I do panels all over the place, but uh, you know, one of my favorite places to do panels is at Cannes. And I do them for the, uh, you know, first of all, I do some panels with Corky at Can, And then I also um, help uh, schedule and also moderate some of the panels at the American Pavilion. And I've actually had the great joy of having Natasha on a panel and Corky on a panel. So anyway. Well, well, well and, and the only follow-up is Dave and I and one other person are responsible for the biggest uh, pajama party during right. Can. Actual pajamas. Three hundred and fifty people last time came in their PJs. What year was that? Let us know. We have the biggest party private. What year was that at the pavilion? That was two years ago, live. Yeah. No, no, no. He said the pavilion. Yeah, they. Pavilion or our villa. Three hundred and fifty people came in their PJs. Patrick, Patrick, you saying the pavilion? Were you saying? The American Pavilion, yeah, I, I produced yeah. a short that I produced a short that showed in 2019 at the American Pavilion, oh, and uh, so I missed you guys. I missed you guys by one year, yeah. but uh, wow. uh, had a great time. My wife and I had a great time. No, 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 no. no. 2019 was our. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, were, we, we just missed each other, but yeah. Oh, we were probably there at the same time, and just yeah. yeah. But we I, had it in 2018 as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I remember the very first pajama party. It was. It was, it was the beginning, and now it's just grown into this massive Thanks. global event. So, yeah. just amazing. Yeah. So, my first question, actually, well, everyone's just doing lots of different things, and you've, you've all got different projects and different things that you're working on. So, what I get asked all the time is, what does a producer do? What is producing? Can I go first? Yeah, cool. All right. So I'm gonna give a I'm gonna give an overly simplistic answer, and then I'm gonna hand it off to everybody else. <laughs> but, but this is so so. I also I'm not I'm not currently a professor, but I've been a professor you know many times for years at different universities. And so um, when I'm teaching producing, the first day of class, I always say this, and I and I stand by it, and I say, you know, to oversimplify. And there's different kinds of producers, but to oversimplify. You know, if you're like the main producer, a producer does two things. And, and, and when I say them, it almost sounds like it's the same thing, but there's actually a dividing line between them. A producer, number one, creates an environment in which the director cannot fail. And then the second thing is a producer creates an environment in which the director can thrive. And they're very similar, but there's a dividing line. The fail part is the fiduciary responsibilities, 
you know, that we've made to the investors and the studios, the distributors and all that, and just making sure, and even the bond company, like, let's finish the film, right? So, cre so let's create a, create a, you know, environment in which this thing's going to happen. And then the second part is, you know what, film is so hard and it, there's, there's risk involved and it, it's exhausting and there's more failure than success. It's like, you know what, if we're going to go through all that, let's make it good. You know, and that's the second part. You know, let's, okay. let's create an environment in which the director can thrive. Mine's a little different when I teach it. At, and I'm now talking about the difference between an executive producer and a producer. All right. I, when I teach it, I say even simpler. A producer is the person who's responsible for making the movie, period. The executive producer is the legal and the business arm to the producer. And, and that's a very simplest, I mean, they take various variations, but that, that's a simple difference. I'm the legal and the business arm to the creative arm, which is the producer who's going to make that movie for me. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Nancy, you wanted to say something as well? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that it, when you look at the jobs that you can't do without, and believe me, all of us are involved and have been involved in independent film, which means that we can wear a lot of hats. But <laughs> Patrick's nodding. But the producer, in essence, I see as the umbrella where all the other hats go underneath. Um, and when you, you can look at it even in terms of what Academy Awards are given for or big awards. Um, when a film wins, it's usually not the director that goes up to accept that, although they can come up to the stage, but it's the producer who accepts that award because they are the one that holds it together. They sew all the threads together. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, again, I totally agree with wearing lots of hats. I mean, I, I'm coming at this more from a micro budget world. Um, and whenever I'm making a feature film, even if I'm directing, I'm still also producing. Um, I'm, you know, and it's, it's not glamorous. I'm handling all the things that, you know, a lot of people don't want, like taking out the trash at a location and make sure that the location is in perfect condition at, at, after we leave. And I know that that's, technically a, a different job for somebody else but for me it's also part of producing i have to make sure that uh you know i i'm got to make sure that everybody's happy and try to again facilitate uh if i'm not directing make sure that it's facilitated for the director i just had a shoot in july that was kind of the first post-covid shoot it was three overnights it was actually a short film and uh i was just producing and i was making sure that everything was properly set up with precautions. I, I handled food as well and made sure that everything was individually wrapped. I mean, those are the kind of things now that we have to deal with, with, with the, the post COVID world. But, um, you know, I always tell people when you're producing a movie, you just have to make, make everything happen and, and obviously treat people with respect because especially in the indie world, everybody knows each other. And uh, it was like, you were talking about the Max Winslow film. And I know, I think my friend DP'd that film. So it's like it's a very small world that we live in. So as a producer, always try to treat people with respect as well because word gets out. And if you want people to come back and keep working on your movies, you know, in the future, it, it's in, imperative that you treat people with respect when you're doing it. Um, don't burn bridges with locations and, uh, you know, keep things efficient. And uh, if you have a core group of people that you enjoy working with, keep working with them because, I mean, I'm based in Kansas City right now and I've worked with largely the same group for the last decade. And uh, we've been able to make films out here. My last feature, which premiered at Fright Fest, um, titled I Am Lisa, we got that film shot in 14 days, which is a ridiculously low amount of time to make a film. And we just had to be very efficient. We had to make sure that we, uh, from a producing standpoint, I had to find locations that were relatively close to each other so that we didn't have large company moves and uh, kept it very streamlined and yeah so I mean I, I, I think that the big part of producing is just making sure everything is efficient and runs smoothly and that you're not burning bridges along the way. Uh, Patrick, uh, I mean Patrick, um, what are the budgets that you feel comfortable doing? I mean I've worked from I mean 
all my budgets have been under a million dollars at this point. But okay. I would be perfectly comfortable doing more than that. But, okay, but my but, budgets have been under that. I mean, because I, as an executive producer, my, part of my job is to protect the money. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can protect the money is we have a completion bond. Mm -hmm. And you can't get a completion bond on a film that's under 1.5. So I typically do not work on films that are low budget, that I can't protect the money. But more importantly, what you have to understand is that before a producer, and I, I hope everyone agrees, before you get to that stage, you're building a team. The right. producer's job is to build his, her, or their team. Because you don't move forward on a project unless you have a team ready to move forward. Because a producer needs a lot of other participants before he, she, or they can move forward. Right, right. Absolutely. That's one of the really key, key things here. So, um, I wanted to ask a question, which yeah. I think is interesting speaking um, to Patrick and even Dave, and I mean, I'm only asking these from my background too, is that since I have worked on everything from smoke and mirrors, as I like to say, to 1.5 million. So <laughs> there's a lot of room in between those right, two. Right, right, right. But I always try to think if I, if budget, you know, the money was there, what are the jobs that you would relieve yourself of? Because I think we've all, I mean, I started at the very bottom and now I'm devoting more time and more energy and will continue to as the founder director of the Franklin International Independent Film Festival. That's truly what I'm loving doing. And, and so if I was to go back into really devoting everything that I had into film, what is your ideal, what does your ideal team look like? What would you give up your, if you got all that money, what would you give it up to? And what would you, David, give up your producer, director? Yeah, all right, so, so I'll tell you what, what I'll do is, especially because this is for um, educational you know, reasons for the film festival and all that. So I'll answer that by first, just real quickly knocking out like who the different producers are. And then I'll say, this is where I would say, so first we start out with the Corky. So basically you got your EP, right? Your executive producer. Then underneath that, despite the fact that IMDB still refuses to create the, the title creative producer, it's so funny, IMDB doesn't put that in there. And yet in the industry, that's what we talk about all the time. Like when you're talking about like the producer, that's the creative producer, right? right? And so, and then, you know, then after the creative producer, you've got some co-producers who, who aren't quite a full producer, but they're very important and they're a part of it for various reasons. Then underneath, you know, underneath co-producers, then you've got, you know, the, uh, the ass prod or the associate producer. And again, they're still on the producing team. They're lower on the, the, the totem pole, but they're still a producer. And they're there again, for any myriad of reasons, they provided an important location or they brought in some of the money right. or, you know, whatever it is. Um, I, you know, and, and I've, oh, I'm sorry. I, forgive me guys. I forgot the line producer. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry That's about that. Talking. The line producer is, you know, is right next to the creative producer, right? And the line right. producer is the one who, who budgets the film and deals with a lot of hiring and firing of the crew and all that kind of stuff. Sorry. I totally yeah, meant getting to the, getting the permits and yeah, depending on whether it's a union film or how large the budget is right next to the line producer, you know, or just under is the UPM. But of course that, that often is dictated by, is it a DGA film? You know, sometimes people will have a UPM even when it's not a DGA film, just so they can differentiate between, between you know, the, the duties that the line producer is doing and what they're having the, the UPM do. The line producer is a little bit more creative role. Uh, the UPM is sort of known as a little bit more uh, crunching the numbers and, and, and doing that for the line producer. But the line producer is over all of it. I, and, and so, and I've taught all of those. Um, and, and so I know how to do the budgeting. And I think a good creative producer should understand budgeting because you, at the end of the day, fiduciary responsibility, you have to answer to, you know, to the powers that be, the investors, and right. so on. 
So, so I, th I feel like an effective uh, creative producer does need to have a knowledge of a line, a line item budget, know how it works, what are good numbers, uh, know the rates, et cetera, et cetera. But then, but, but beyond that, I, you know, so I know how to do that and I've taught that, but I prefer the creative producing uh, role and I have some great, you know, UPMs and, and line producers, you know, a couple of them out there that I, that I like to pull in and I like to use. Not that I can't run those numbers, but because I feel like it's so important when you're working on a film that you need to, everybody needs to be in their lane and they need to be good at what they do in their lane. And so I am average when it comes to being a line producer, but I think I'm really good at actually networking and some of the skill sets that come with a creative producer. So anyway. Yeah, but I mean, you just still didn't say, where would you put that? No, for me, Money. creative. You see, if you didn't have to do every single job, because you know, in the end, it's your ass on the ground, excuse right. my word, who would you be the one you would hire is what I wanted to know from you. And, 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 and Patrick, who would you hire to relieve yourself of that one piece? So the line, for me, I'll just answer real quick and I'll hand it off to Patrick. For me, it's the line producer first. Hire the yeah. line producer working with me and the other create, parts of the creative team above the line, you know. And then it's definitely a line producer for me too. I mean, I'm working on a, a film right now where uh, I'm looking for a line producer and I've worked with one that I, I'm, you know, good friends with out of Charleston, South Carolina. I actually worked on a TV show called the inspectors back in 2017. And he was a line producer for the entire series. It was a CBS show. So I'm thinking about hiring him to alleviate some stress, obviously for the next film, because, you know, with, 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 with uh, I am Lisa, it was one of those things where, all the roles kind of overlapped each other. You know, I was directing, but I, I was also worrying about, okay, uh, there was a day where it was gonna be 105 degrees. So we had a heat advisory and they're like, okay, if you don't need to be outside, don't go outside. But the problem was that the second that we moved that day, it became a house of cards or a domino effect. We would lose a location down the road. Uh, we would end up not having the camera that we rented for a specific day. So it was one of those things where we had to power through. And it would be nice to not have to worry about that and have somebody else worry about those things. But as an indie filmmaker, you're also, you know, managing those things on top of also directing. So it would be nice that, you know, I'm primarily a director. So it would be nice to only focus on those, those things and, you know, and, and, uh, but, uh, you know, we shot a movie in the middle of July in Kansas City, so those problems were going to come up. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> uh, Patrick, Patrick? Yes. I, I forgot to tell you, you've got my, one of my favorite barbecue places in Kansas City. Which one? Uh, Brian's. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, my God. It, 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 if you ever go to Kansas City and you like barbecue, it's Yeah, we have the best barbecue, for sure. Yeah, Brian's. It, hey, it's... hey, wait a second. We're in Nashville, man. I, you know. <laughs> I think one of Torky's secret little um, uh, shame, you know, people go, oh, that's my secret shame, is that he loves barbecue. And when he goes to cities that have specialties, he's kind of a connoisseur of the different types of barbecue, right, Corky? Well, I think that's very important for an executive producer when they're going out to dinner at various places to know yeah. what is good food. So we're thinking I mean, craft, craft. I mean, we can talk about we can talk about catering and the importance of having making sure everybody's well fed on a movie. Man, that exact expression was the first thing I was told in my first <laughs> one, and I'm I'm going to mute myself for Natasha's sake. But but for the first day, I said, well, well, okay, I'm going to produce this, and I know I've got the money and everything. But but what is your advice to a friend of mine who was an Oscar qualifier? And she said, feed the s. It's so true. Them. It's so true because it's one of those things where you know I work with a lot of guys who are making a lot more money doing corporate videos, you know, or, or commercials in Kansas City. And obviously I pay them a rate that, that, that works, but they're not making the same amount of money. And I'm like, well, the least you can do is make sure everybody is super well fed because I guarantee you, if the food isn't good on day one, you're gonna hear about it. Yeah, yeah and a lot of conviviality occurs around, around sitting and eating. You know, I remember I, I, did, I directed a family film a couple of years ago. Um, another it was it was the budget was under 200,000. It was a very, very it was a 16 day shoot and we had animals, um, which was interesting. First day, the caterer shows up, rear ends one of the other crew members cars 
and basically didn't have any food to feed the crew. And so we're like, you know, it was almost like a revolt on day one. And I was like, all right, we're, we're fixing this problem. Day two, we had the best food and for the rest of the shoot, it was fantastic. <laughs> okay, Natasha, it's back to you. Wow, um, I mean, I completely agree with all of that. So yeah, f food, good catering, feeding everybody, really important. And creating an environment where the whole team works well together, the director can create his vision. I agree with everything you've all said. Um, Corky, I have a question for you. Okay. You've, you've worked on a lot of deals with writers and from a legal perspective as well. Yeah. So tell yeah. us a little bit more about that. How do you put all the right legal things in place, working together with different people or the contracts? Tell us a bit more about that part of what you do. Oh, well, okay, well, all right. Um, this is more of a lawyer question than it is a producing question. Um, but I'll try and tie them both in. When I get hired, I usually get hired to be both the lawyer and the executive producer for the film. So wearing both of those hats, I'm going to help build the team. I'm going to find out who, who is part of the team right now. Do, do I have a screenplay? Is a screenplay right? If a screenplay needs to be fixed, I'll usually bring it to Dave DeBoard to read it and fix <laughs> the screenplay. Okay, then I'll look at who else do I need for the team in the development stage. I'll bring in maybe a producer. I may bring in a director. I may uh, uh, bring it and an actor, but however I define my team to move forward, uh, then I draft all the legal documents for the money, which is very important. And unless you have the investor documents, you can't get, get any money. Once I prepare those, I um, send it out to some of my funding sources. And very interestingly, People call me almost every week and ask me to try to get funding for them. And I tell them I don't, I don't disclose my funding sources with people who are not clients of mine. And they will invariably tell me they have a lawyer already. And I say to them, then go ask your lawyer to get money for you because I'm not going to disclose my funding sources on projects that I'm not the attorney on. Then when it comes to a movie, like I'm doing two movies now for um, for a Rudy Langless, who's an Academy Award producer. Um, he produced Hotel Wanda, Hurricane, Sugar Hill, Redemption, and it's a film called Miles and Me. And it's on the last stage of Miles Davis' life. And I will be doing all the contracts. I won't be doing the negotiations, but I'll draft every contract for the movie and, and all the distribution contracts uh, from soup to nuts. Um, I will get them insurance. I'll get them E&O insurance. I'll make sure that the film is bondable. I will make sure that we are ready to move forward. Um, and uh, that, that's pretty much uh, what I do. And, um, but during COVID, um, if you're gonna do a movie during, during COVID, you, you should have a COVID clause in your contract, but SAG came out and said, they're not gonna honor any COVID exclusions from contracts. So since you can't have that, you have to create an environment and hire more people to make sure everyone's safe. So it beefs up the budget. You've got to bring in the nurses and you've got to bring in the testing people. And it becomes a whole thing unless you're Tyler Perry, who has a studio in Atlanta and he creates his own bubble and nobody comes out of his studio when they're making the uh, movie and everyone has their temperature taken per day, but they don't leave the studio. So he creates his own bubble. Does that sort of answer it, Natasha? Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's so many things that just 
that you have to do as a producer and also all oh, the plus, legal things. Uh, plus, plus, I was very fortunate that a, a couple years ago, 66,000 people, including people in London, uh, voted for me to be as the best entertainment lawyer and executive producer in the United States. Although I paid 65,000 of them, but 66,000 did vote. Wow, excellent, Corky. That's brilliant. Thank you for joining us today. So I want to know a little bit more from Nancy. You are also the Vice President of Women in Film and TV International, as well as the President of Tennessee Women in, is it Women in Film? Women in Media? Tennessee Women in Film and Media, but to be an international, you have to have women in film in your title and we are okay. compliant with all the rules of international. Hey, hey real quick, I'm gonna have to disconnect and then reconnect, sorry. Okay, thanks. Ciao for now. Yeah, I'll be back. <laughs> Um, anyway, yes, I am. Yeah, and you also, um, you also, you were saying you you run the uh, Franklin International Independent Film Festival. So tell us a bit more about all the other things you do as well as producing. Well, uh, so the Franklin International Film Festival is in its fourth year. Um, we, of course, had to postpone and postpone. And now, because I'm so committed to some of the films that we have, some of the features from Bastards Road and Wish Man, uh, you know, to The Prison Within. I mean, we have these amazing films that I feel deserve to be seen, which is why we're doing the uh, drive-in movie thing. But also, uh, again, I feel this commitment to bringing film to people because there's nothing that sparks communication unless you have a book club, <laughs> then film and film festivals, because it's a way to open up people's minds. Um, I've been involved in women in film because my career started back when Toast was invented, and I worked on a television show called Grizzly Adams. And when I worked on that show at the bottom of the barrel, I just said to myself, you know, this is it. This is for me. This is what I'm gonna do. And I had no desire to work on the other side of the camera, but I wanted to know everything that I could grab onto about that. So within that, I began to see through the years, both marginaliza marginalization of women within the industry. And I wanna say, especially on the back side of the camera, you know, uh, for a long time, the only notice was, oh, quote unquote, the casting couch, which took place on both the front and the back of the camera, but also opportunities where I would see women in different positions as I was moving up that I felt were highly capable and highly incredible. And it came down to, well, would I put $50,000 into this woman who's just starting in her career and I've got a lot of word of mouth on her, but why would I give her a job when this guy comes off of, you know, like 10 films where he's doing a really good job. Now my attitude towards that, which Corky can validate is hire the woman. And I know you'd okay. have to fight for that woman to uh, a big uh, studio okay. perhaps, okay. but my feeling is if they don't get the chance, they can't rise or fail, where a guy could have had plenty of opportunity to rise or fail. So I got involved in women in film, and lucky for me, they, you know, I became president of my chapter, which is the state of Tennessee. And then through that, I got a call from International Women in Film, who said, I know you're a really small chapter, but it sounds like you're doing a lot of things. And International Women in Film brought me in, which then it gave me an opportunity, and Corky's opportunity to be panelists at different film festivals. I am the moderator of the African Pavilion um, films. And you know, Nollywood out of Nigeria is the second largest, you know, filmmaking community now. And a lot of people don't realize it's Bollywood, Nollywood, and then Hollywood and so forth and so on. And uh, so it's afforded me an opportunity to get different perspectives on what women are doing and therefore get perspectives on what men are doing. And my idea has never been me too or you too. It's us, what we can do together. But I feel as women have risen, especially on my side of the camera, have been rising, you, you take a better place and, and you work well better with men because you don't feel like you're not given a chance, except for cinematography. Well, There's well, only been one time a woman was nominated, 
for an Academy Award and lucky for her, she won. Okay, but well, I, I, I can tell you something about, how, about, about Nancy. As good a connector as I am, or think I am, she's the best. If you have Nancy on your team, you've got the best connector you have. And just quickly to follow up, Nancy said she take she take the woman who hasn't done much. Well, a, a, during during Sundance panels, and sometimes I, I get blasted for it, I say the example of this. I have a $10 million movie. I'm the executive producer. I have a $10 million movie. I've got the 10 million. I've got it. And we have to decide who's gonna direct the movie. And, and I've got someone who was nominated for an Academy Award at last year's Academy Award that wants to direct the movie. He's a guy. And I have a woman who is a director and wants to direct it. She hasn't directed a movie in 25 years. All right? Decent, but I've got a guy. All right, so who do I pick? Who do I bank my money on? Because I'm the person to protect the money. And I say, I would normally go for the guy who was nominated for best director last year at the Academy Award because I'm protecting the money. Now, that doesn't mean that the woman doesn't deserve a, the job, but I, okay, so I got booed, all right? I got booed, but still it's something that I have to think about and it doesn't mean that the woman wouldn't do a good job. It's just, I don't have time to fight. I really don't have time in my daily life to to want to fight. That's the, that's that's what it's about. It, it, and it protects the money. Now, it could be a bad choice. And I'm not taking away from what Nancy feels because she'll fight for it. And I respect that. I will, because I feel like, I feel like uh, what happens there is that I think when a woman looks at something, because we've had to sometimes fight really hard for that, is that to sit at that table, or we did in the past, I'll put it that way, questions that I would get asked along the road would always be over lunch or in a, in a different room than where the meeting was taking place. Well, what do you think, man? Da -da 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 -da. We've got da -da -da. And they'd ask my opinion and they'd go in and they'd fight my, for my opinion as though it was theirs. And it's okay that I didn't get, my big thing is get that film made. So it's okay that I didn't get the credit then, but as the years go by and I see myself fighting for other women, I think, man, the women that are actually fighting for their role, those roles, they are not a fly by night. They're somebody who's working really hard, who's dotting every I and crossing every T to get the chance. And they take that idea of failure really damn seriously. Um, I'll speak to Catherine Hardwick, you know, who has been, you know, fired a million times, but, but she gets brought in to clean up a mess, and then sometimes she would get fired in mid-production from there, so the nephew of the producer or the nephew of the, you know, the guy bringing in other money, you know, comes in and gets that role and that title. We all that are sitting here know that that's BS and makes us sad that that happens, but the women who want to stay in this career, we eat those curds and we step back because we really believe that we've got a place and ultimately we will get there. You know, there's a lot of roads up the mountain, but when you get to the top, the view is the same. It's a matter of walking up those roads, wearing every hat and getting there to stand Honestly, I don't know any woman that I've worked with in indie film that wants the title without knowing what the work was. It's so like, that's a good thing. But maybe in the studios it's different. How do you feel about the example I gave? If you were presented as a producer with the same situation, Academy Award guy, I mean nominated, or, or the woman? Can, can I jump in? Uh, yes. All right. So, so here's what I would say. I would say I would I would split the difference in in this sense. If if the funding and <clears throat> excuse me the 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 talent you know the leads um, were such that if that it absolutely rose and fell with the um, 
you know, with the fame or the accomplishments or the credentials of the, of the director in that case, I would say, well, you know, like you said, like, Hey, you got to, you have to protect, you know, the money you, you, that, that's what you're there to do. The other, but, but then on the flip side of that, what I would also say is, but if you're on a, if you're on a project where there are other parts of it that are solid enough, like you already have talent, like, you know, the money's already coming in. In other words, it doesn't all fall, you know, rise and fall with whether or not you get this elite, you know, elite, as far as credentials go, uh, director, then I would say, you know, um, Hey, you gotta, you know, you gotta send the elevator down, you know, it's like, you know, you gotta, you gotta get, you gotta, you know, make opportunities for women and, you know, people of color and, and things like that. So I, so I don't know, I don't know if I'm saying it the right way, but I feel like, I feel like, you know, it's not just one or the other, but I do feel like, <laughs> case by case, right? I mean, case by case. I don't, I don't think that my, my thing wasn't a woman who directed 20 years ago. My thing was if you had a woman who, who'd done a lot of work and you could recognize it and she had bona fides, that she should have that chance. If she, if you see her work and she has that and then, then she should be given that chance. You know, Catherine Hardwick. I'll, I'll bet, Hardwick. Man, but, uh, what are your feelings? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with Dave, I guess, on, on some things. Like, I feel like it, it depends also on, and again, like I, bringing in a, interviewing a director and seeing how they mesh with, with the other people, you know, or, or, you know, seeing how the, there has to be chemistry. I always say whenever I'm putting together a team, I feel like it's like a dating, it's like a dating thing where you're trying to figure out who's going to work best with who. And ultimately, are you, are you there? Hello. Oh, did I lose you? David oh, back. Oh. <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, no, hey, I mean, I'm sorry. There we go. I had a problem with my uh, with my with my sound system. Give me one second. There we go. But ultimately, when I'm when I'm when I'm directors, producers, whatever, I like to get everybody together and see who's. If, if there's like some chemistry there, synergy between the people, uh, you know, I, I mean, and that comes down to not just directors, but it comes down to crew but, and, and- I mean, Patrick, but it, as a producer, if you get a director first- Right. The director usually can recommend and get certain talent that you'd also sure. like, you can also, so it's a double-edged sword. There's no right answer, but it's a right. subject that we can discuss and discuss. So. Uh, Natasha, before we run out of time, is there anything else that you want to ask us? Well, uh, this is a fascinating discussion, this one. Um, it, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with all of you, really. But um, my final question to everyone is, when you, you, you get tons of projects, so what is it about a project that says to you, yes, this is the one, I'm going to get involved in this? What's the key thing for each of you to get involved with something? Oh, wow. Okay. For me, and, and it's very simple, uh, it's the story. Um, uh, people, unfortunately, pay me a little to read their screenplays and provide oral business coverage because I think they should ha have a little sweat in the game. So not a thousand people send me screenplays, but once I read a screenplay, it's visual, and then I decide in my feeble mind whether it's marketable or not, whether I can do something, I mean, with it. So it starts with the story, um, because if the story's good and grabs me, and I think I can send it out to my people that I want to get involved, then I'm way ahead of the game. So it's really simply the story. I mean, I would say for me, I always am looking for something. If I'm directing, I'm always looking for something that I can relate to in the story. Um, in the in the instance of uh, the family film, and I normally don't do family film. I'm I'm primarily a horror director, but 
when I got sent this family film script and the producer reached out to me, I said, I, I found something in the story that I could hook onto, I guess. Like I'm a, I'm a father and it was about a father and daughter relationship. So those are the things that like, I, I can see relating to a, uh, having mass appeal, having, having a, a commercial value. And, um, and the same thing with I Am Lisa, when the writer pitched it to me, I was like, that's a cool idea. I like the story. There has to be a spark, something inside of you that sparks and says, I want to do this. Um, Cause I, I do read a lot of scripts and, and, and you know, a lot of them I end up passing on because there's just something about it that isn't hooking me. And so ultimately it's the hook of the story. And also being that I, I, I you know, I've been working with smaller budgets. I also have to look at and say, is this doable right now? Am I able to pull this off and produce this uh, and, and do it on a reasonable budget and deliver it on time? And, uh, you know, obviously if it has a bunch of car chases, most likely can't, can't pull that off right now. Now I don't know how about you. Oh, she muted. Sorry, I'm mute. Um, <laughs> Okay, so interestingly enough, again, it's the story, it's the story, it's the story. That, it can't just be an interesting story for me, although I'll, what I do with those that are I'm on the fence about, or I think, gee, that's interesting, kind of like what Patrick says, but what I like to do is I like to go back to that person, I say, send it to me in a tweet, send me the entire story in one tweet. And if they can encapsulate that and I can still feel something about that, then I'd like to really look over the script again. Because sometimes when somebody's just giving me just a, a small synopsis, I get, if I get all confused and I don't know where the story is going and I don't have any kind of feeling for the characters and I'm not gracious enough to give them in the first 10 minutes, I wanna know in the first four minutes, what's going on to who, and why or the obstacles you know i need to know that in a documentary i want to feel that it's timely that i can relate to it so that if i'm producing it that i know that i believe in it because even though uh you're not supposed to necessarily you don't believe in fiction it's got to have an element that if that i can feel something about and that I guess is what I could relate to or I could see happening to somebody I know or care about or that. That's got to, just the same thing you're reading a newspaper and there's an article and you go, whoa. I don't say, whoa, that would be commercial, but I say I feel something about that and we could tell that story. But everything else comes into play as well. The viability and who's going to be attracted to it. Hi, uh, Dave. Hey. Yeah, I, I, so obviously the story is big, but for me, I think the people are bigger, especially because, you know, I'm a screenwriter, so I can always take a story and, and help out the story, but if the people that are bringing me into it are, um, you know, I, I have to believe in them, and I have to believe that I will get along with them, they'll get along with me, and, um, you know, that, that, that there is there's a there's a there's a team that can be built there uh, because at the end of the day, like I've I've been a part of some projects that I eventually was no longer a part of that had a good decent story, but the people that were involved in it eventually I I discovered were people that I did not want to be involved with, and then I've been then I've been pulled into projects where the story, quite honestly, was super basic. Um, there was nothing inherently special to me about that story, but I believe that the people were good folks and that they would be supportive of me and I could support them. And then based on that, that led me to go, okay, if they are willing, you know, I'm willing to take their notes, if they're willing to take my notes and, um, you know, we can, and we're, we're willing to, you know, put skin in the game and link arms and make something happen you know, then I can make this work. So I think for me, story is important, but the people that are pulling me into it, I would say are even more important. Mm -hmm. I John Freeman. Uh, one further uh, story very quickly to, to talk about this. We have a Chicago screenwriting contest that's gonna culminate and announce a winner on November 7th. 
And uh, the city of Chicago sponsored it and the cultural affairs division and the city film office sponsored it. And what they got and the subjects had to be one of inequality, all right? Or it had to be something related to inequality, all right? Those were, that was the, I mean, topic. They got 350 films. I mean, screenplays, 350. And fortunately, they had a lot of readers, right? And the readers of the 350 uh, screenplays narrowed it down to five. And there are five judges. And we each got a screenplay to read. And it was very interesting because of the five judges, and we all spoke uh, last Thursday, to get an idea of where we were. And we all zeroed in on two screenplays, two of the five. And we all said we, we would pick either of those two stories and we would make the movie. I mean, we had money, we had, we had money on it. And, we, and what we have to do by November 7th is pick one. And the unfortunate part is that we're probably gonna go back to the second at some time later, the second of the two. But this, both stories were so compelling and both of them were based on fact. Wow. Oh. So just one final thing from everyone then, just if you want to summarize what you're doing now, how people should get in touch or if there's anything you want people to connect with, the project or anything where people can connect with you or something that you're up to. Final words from everyone, please. I would rather, Natasha, is they contact you. Okay. And you can give them my email and my private phone number. I'd rather they go through you. Okay. You can contact me through Facebook, uh, Patrick Ray, R-E-A. Um, I'm also on Instagram, and I'm always updating on where my projects are showing and uh, what my next project is going to be. So uh, feel free to uh, contact me through social media. Excellent. Thank you. Nan, how can people get in touch with Franklin International Independent Film Festival? <clears throat> I would direct them to social media as well. Uh, the www.fiiff.org is our is our film festival site, which certainly gives you an idea of the kind of uh, things that uh, that we find particularly inspiring. Um, as far as my projects are going and things like that, I'm not. How do I make that? I'm really, really busy right now and through the end of the year. But I am also happy to make time to mentor or give information to somebody else. If I can be of help, it's my honor. Like sitting here today is so inspiring to me today just to be among these people. So uh, thank you. Thank so you. my final word would be would be get in again, get in touch with me through you. If it comes through you, I will immediately look at it and I will immediately pay attention. And uh, uh, again, it's such a pleasure to be among these people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nan. Such a pleasure to have you. Uh, Dave? Yeah, so um, I would say, yeah, if you if you want to get a hold of me, probably email is the best way to do it. Um, I could say it, but instead of taking a long time to spell it, because it's kind of a longer one, um, uh, Natasha has my email. It's, it's boardproductions at gmail.com. But, um, but if you want to make sure that you're spelling it correctly, you could probably, <laughs> if it's okay with Natasha, you could probably get a hold of her. But, uh, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm working on different projects, but I'm always, you know, if, uh, you know, I'm, uh, if, if there's a, if there's a project that's a, that is a real project, then, um, then, you know, I'm always, you know, open to having a, a conversation about that. And the last thing I would say is, uh is that you know out of the pr projects that i'm working on there's one in particular the one that i'm working that i'm actively working on with corky uh that is a music biopic um that one i'll just give a little teaser is getting very exciting we're working on another draft of the script 
and uh, and and there is without without tipping our hand, there is actually an A list. Um, there is an A list actress who will be reading uh, one of the drafts when when we're ready to send it to her. So that one's really exciting. I don't even know if, if Corky knew that, but it's exciting. Well, that's okay. Uh, Corky will find out. So, um, <laughs> of course you will. Uh, of course so, you will. So, okay. So, Natasha, uh, I think that your audience should know that you're going to be on a panel during the Sundance panels, which are January 30th, yeah. and and then Nancy too. And uh, Dave, I I'll try and get you on a panel too that we're putting together. But it's uh, January 30th. We don't have the time. We'll get the event right out. And and um, I will have great panels. And you'll be very eager to hear what Natasha has to say when I moderate. <laughs> Corky, don't you have a podcast too? Corky, aren't you doing a podcast as well? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so I do uh, podcasts too. And we're going to have Nancy on our next uh, podcast. So we have great great people on our podcast that I do. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, we do a podcast. Amazing, excellent. Well, thank you guys for your time today. I don't think we heard Patrick though, did we? Oh. He yeah. didn't finish. Oh, I, um, yeah, just for social media, I said just reach out to me on Facebook and Instagram. Um, again, Patrick Ray, R-E-A, and then same on Instagram. And I'm again, I'm always posting where my films are playing, if they're at film festivals or... Um, and next uh, year you'll be in Franklin. Yeah, totally, totally. If we can, if we can, I'll drive my whole family there. We'll, we'll just Lovely. go road trip. Um, but yeah, what, no, what, what, yeah, and I'll say this one last thing. If you want to attend the Can Pajama Party, private message me or Corky okay. and, and we'll put you guys, we'll put you on the list. But, but I, you know, I'm, sad, I'm sad I missed it that la the last but, time. But, but that's assuming. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there as well. But that assuming can is live. Yeah, right. It, yeah, it will be. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. We've already got a house. We're good. Yes. Well, I'll go Rilla on home, but I'm not pulling the trigger until February be, uh, be, be, because I'm not going to know. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you guys. Bye. bye everyone. Bye.